Welcome everyone. My name is Nikki Johnston and I'm with Transition Advisors. Our webinar today is Keys to Due Diligence and Client Retention. Before we begin, we need to cover just a few important items. First, please take a moment to close any programs that might be running on your computer. This will just help to ensure quality presentation and reduce any audio issues. Transition Advisors LLC is a proud and approved sponsor on the National Registry of CPA Sponsors per NASDA. Under NASDA's guidelines, today's 50-minute session will qualify for one CPE credit. In order to receive that credit, you must complete two requirements. The first is that you participate in all three of the polling questions, and please note that GoToWebinar does monitor your participation in the polls. Next, you must also complete the online evaluation. This will appear on your screen immediately when the session ends, so please do not close your browser until you've taken a moment to complete that survey. Once you've met both of those requirements, I will email your CPE certificate within 10 business days. Now, in order to fully participate in the webinar, take a moment to familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar control panel. You should see it on the right-hand side of your screen. There's an orange arrow on the top of the panel. You can use that to minimize the panel. During the presentation, all participants are muted, but you can communicate with us by using the question box that you'll see toward the bottom of the panel. Just type in your question and click send, and Joel will answer questions as they come up through the session today. Joel will also be sharing his webcam during the presentation, and you will be able to resize it, minimize it, or even close the webcam if you wish. Finally, I'd like to remind you that Transition Advisors offers a free CPE webinar each month. We have just one session left for this calendar year that will take place on December 14th. Our CEO, Terry Putney, will present a session on admitting new partners. To register for that, you can go to our website, transitionadvisors.com. Now, before I hand it over to Joel, we'll go ahead and launch the first polling question for today. You'll see that here on your screen. The first question is, how many equity partners do you have in your firm? So your options are there, 1, 2 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 19, or 20 plus. And I'll give everyone just a moment to answer before we close it. Okay, looks like we've got nearly everybody. I'll go ahead and close the poll. And the results are there on the screen. So Joel, we have 63% of the folks on the call, just one equity partner. 31% are in that 2 to 4 range, and 6% are in 5 to 9. So I'm also going to send a quick message here to everyone. This is a link to the PDF of the slides. You received that link in your emails that you got, the reminders, but I've sent it just there as well. If you have any trouble clicking on that link and would like for me to email you the slides as an attachment, you can just reply to any of the GoToWebinar messages that you got. That'll go directly to me. You can also email me there if you have any questions about CPE later. Uh, for now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today's session. Joel Sinkin is the President of Transition Advisors. Thank you all and enjoy the webinar. Well, hopefully we got that screen showing. Is it up there, Nikki? Well, I can see your screen, but I can't see the webcam just yet, Joel. Mm. Okay, let's try it again. Isn't that strange? Still nothing, huh, Nikki? No, just the PowerPoint. Yes, we're doing the same thing we did in our trial run, but having no success right now. I don't know what to tell you. Would you like me to take the controls back and give it to you again to try? Or let's should we just try one more time. Okay, yeah, let's sure. try one more time. And I think we might have resolved the problem. And we yeah. have. Forgive me, everybody, for that musical interlude, but we wanted to get you a face made for the radio. But to, So you do have the option of getting rid of me. But some of you, for some reason, seem to like to have that video. But today we're going to be doing a very unique class session. We're going to be talking about keys to retaining staff, keys to retaining clients, and what to look at if you perform for when, when performing due diligence. This will include if you're from the buyer's perspective, from the seller's perspective, or from the merger's perspective. 
I never like to make a CPE class an info commercial, but I do think it's important to know a little bit about the background of the speaker. For the last 27 years, the only thing I've done to help accounting firms in growth and succession strategies through mergers and acquisitions. I'm the adv succession advisor to the AICPA, write for many publications, and have been involved in over 800 closings of accounting firms. So we've made a lot of mistakes, we've seen a lot of mistakes, but we try really hard not to make the same mistake twice. So the more you screw up, the more experience you have, and hopefully the, the better you can avoid those issues going forward. Although we're going to go over a lot of different things today, a lot of people always hope that I'm going to be able to address everything they need to know about, in this case, integration, transition, uh, due diligence. But if there's 50 things you need to know about each of these topics, the smartest one in the room is going to think of 35. And the reason for that is the tremendous uniqueness of accounting firms. Today on our class are a lot of small firms. If I took five of you with the same amount of revenue and same amount of partners, there may not be anything else the same. So we're going to be able to give you a lot of parameters today, but remember the uniqueness of each deal will make certain modifications required on your part. The best way of retaining the maximum amount of clients in a merger or acquisition is choosing the right successor firm. I know it's an overly simple thing to say, but it is so important that the people that are merging together or buying or selling each other are choosing the right partners in this transaction. So if I'm looking for succession, there's a couple of things I should start off with right off the bat. One of the first questions I always ask is, why do you want to merge? What, what's your thinking? Most of the time, you get great answers. You know, we've really increased our technology platform and we brought in some good young talent. We have a lot of extra capacity. We're looking to use this and promote the growth. Those are great answers. Here's a scary answer. I've got a lot of extra space. I have some extra capacity. So I thought I'd be able to lower my overhead by doing a merger. If the only purpose of a merger or is to reduce overhead, it seems an awful lot of overkill. If that's your only goal, live together. You don't have to get married. In a merger or an acquisition, we spend more waking time with our partners than our spouse. Just to reduce overhead is not needed to become partners. That you could do with a sublet. But why do they want to merge? How is their staffing situation? If they're the successor firm, can they absorb the work that, I'm, that I need help with doing? Or when I retire, can they replace me both in capacity and skill set? Do you have the space to physically move us in? How is their IT platform compared to ours? And amazingly, how rare the seller does any due diligence on the buyer. One of the first things I'd like to know is, what kind of financial strength do they have? If they're robbing from Peter to pay Paul, I don't want to wake up one day being Peter. And remember, bigger is not always better. Better is better. Since predominantly most of you on the, on the session with us today are small firms, you have to keep in mind that you do a voluminous amount of hand-holding. It's nothing negative, it is what it is. But uh, we're the shell answer men and women at our firms, and as much as we do a lot of the complicated issues, a lot of what we do is holding the hands of our clients. If you took your practice and sold it to a top 100 firm, are they going to invest with the same level, partner level talent, that type of handholding? So you gotta be careful that bigger isn't just better. Now, most of the time, you're going to need a firm that has capacity to replace you if you're looking for succession. Therefore, they most likely will be bigger. But does their cultures and other things make sense? These are some of the things you need to think about. Other things is, in choosing the right successor, is specialties you offer. For example, if you're in New Jersey and you do audits of government and municipalities, you need to be an RMA, a registered municipal's accountant. If you don't have that license, if you don't have that specialty, you can't be my successor. It's just one example. One of the other things is, in addition to the size of the successor, is how are their retention rates? If they're not retaining their own clients, why would you think they're gonna be able to retain yours? And do they have the capacity on the levels we need? Maybe not only am I slowing down, but, my, but one of my strongest and long-term accountants 
is also going to look to slow down. Maybe it's not just me they have to replace, but some other people. One of the things that people often bring up, it relates to location, meaning how far could I move my practice? I think some people miss the boat on this. For example, if all your clients come to you, then your office is pretty geographically sensitive. It doesn't mean you can't move one zip code over. You don't have to stay in the exact same building. But clearly, if everybody's coming to your office, there's a geographic sensitivity. Conversely, if you're like many firms, where between the cloud, portals, email, faxes, staff going out to pick up the work, very few clients are coming to your location, then your location isn't as sensitive other than from a staff and ownership perspective. So keep in mind, the more flexible you could be about location, the greater the, the, the uh, package of buyers that will be interested in you. If I'm only ready to do a deal with someone who's going to keep me in the same place, I'm going to have a much smaller audience. Here I am facing potentially the last and most important decision I make that relates to the practice. I want to maximize my audience, not shrink it. So having flexibility of locations, important. Another reason not to sign a long-term lease if you're going to be looking to do a merger or a sale in the near future. Don't make those commitments to you. Does the successor firm have similar billing rates, which we'll discuss further in a minute? Professional credentials and the culture. Culture is a critical thing in matching up. Culture includes a lot of things. For example, the difference between brand loyal and partner loyal clients. IT has its own culture. It's very hard for some firms to merge up. If I'm not paperless, I'm not on the cloud, I don't have portals, I don't have multiple screens, I could be overwhelmed by a firm that wants to do that to me overnight. IT actually has a culture. Also, in choosing the right successor, sometimes you're looking internally on, on your bench, saying, I might have a good successor here right now. Well, that's great. Put them in the position of proving it. Give them more responsibilities. Make sure they can manage them before you turn over your entire practice to them. The most important thing in choosing the quote-unquote right successor is the four C's that I preach all the time. The first C is chemistry. If you don't want to eat lunch with someone, don't merge with them. For you who are smaller firms, if you're in a geographic area of the country that has a lot of other accounting firms, that means your clients had choices, but they chose to go to you. Most of them don't know if you're competent or incompetent because if they knew that much to measure your technical skills, they'd be doing the work without hiring you unless there's an, a test function that they need someone else to do. So why do you have your clients? It's because of you. It's the culture you've created. It's the chemistry between the parties, but it's mainly a trust factor. So your clients are there because of you. If you're not comfortable with a successor, why would you think your clients and staff would be? So if there's the most important C to me is the C in chemistry. Other things that are critically important is continuity. The clients like the way my ship is sailing. They like the way I do my billing. If they love the way I'm doing my billing, I should raise my fees. They should live with the way I'm doing my billing. But I want, you need someone who's going to offer a lot of continuity and keep the ship sailing in the same direction. Do the cultures fit up? Culture's a big word. I've seen culture apply to IT, quality control issues. I've seen it apply to dress codes, hours that we work, tax season habits, the way we bill. But a great shortcut to understanding culture is looking at it from three perspectives. One, what's it like to be an owner in the firm? Two, what's it like to be a staff person in the firm? Three, what's it like to be a client in this firm? Understanding and going deep into these, these aspects of culture will help you see if their cultures align between your two firms. And do they have the capacity and, and skill set to take over the roles that are going to be diminished? If we're a two-partner firm, my partner Nikki is going to stay on for 12 more years, but I want to slow down in the next two they have the capacity and skill set to replace me. Because what we're trying to create here is a good deal for both people, because that's a fair deal. I, as a seller, should be paid for my years of sweat equity, but the buyer has to make a profit. Well, why would they do the deal? So it's a package. It's, it's what the value of the staff, the client base, everything coming together. So these are some of the things you need to think about 
of choosing the right successor. When we are do doing a merger or an acquisition or a sale, one of the key things that are going to help us is staff retention. Now sometimes, especially in, in larger firm deals, the successor firm will be wildly interested in keeping all the professional staff, most likely the staff that all have client contact. Where there may be some changes is on the clerical side. How many people do I need to answer the phone if that's their only function? But for the most part, in an environment where you cannot find good staff, part of what makes your practice more valuable is having good, competent, appropriately compensated staff. Now, they're going to have several fears when they find out about a merger or an acquisition. Their fears are mainly three categories. How is this going to impact compensation paid to me? How is this going to impact my security in this firm? Am I going to be gone in a month? Am I going to be a long-term player here? And how will my role change, if at all? Because remember, as we'll talk about with transitioning clients, change is a dirty word to a lot of people. Somehow we always have to take away the concept of change. It's not the loss of my firm, it's the gain of the combined firms. That's how we have to make this and package this to both the staff and to the uh, clients. Now, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, who do I tell and when and what should I say to my staff? It's a very tricky thing. Sometimes out of pure loyalty, I respect the fact that people want to share a lot more before they should with certain staff. There are exceptions where it's almost impossible not to share with the staff. For example, there's some critical staff that actually control the client relationships. If they're not on board, you have a problem. But you should recognize that in most situations, other than owners, no staff are going to be part of this uh, look-see into a merger acquisition until the deal's closed. Usually the time between closing and the effective date leaves us a window. For example, we just had a closing last week that's not effective till January 1. So they're going to share everything with their staff shortly, but it's not effective till January 1. So most of the time you have windows to do this. There are risks involved in bringing the, the staff into your circle of trust on a merger. First of all, maybe they've heard some things about that firm that they're not going to, you're not going to have a chance to overcome. Where if you announce it at a later date and, and you're bringing in meetings and everything else, as we'll discuss in a minute with the new team, you might have a better chance to overcome it. But more of the bigger risks is sometimes people will share with staff that I'm looking into a merger. What the staff might say is, well, maybe I don't want them picking my next boss. Maybe I should pick out my own boss. Now, if you're a competent professional CPA today, and you're looking for a job, they're out there. So putting your staff in a position of not knowing what this merge is going to mean for them, they may not object anything to you, but they might start looking in the help wanted area. So you're putting yourself at risk, bringing them into that circle too soon. Once you know a deal is going to happen, obviously then we have to share it. Some people are so important in the firm, you're gonna have a one-to-one. -one sit down, talk with them, and let them know and assure them of their concerns. Hopefully, we've addressed them all prior to the merger occurring. Uh, ultimately, there's usually a firm-wide meeting where we bring both firms together and have a, have a lunch together and get to know each other, meet each other, and share ideas. Sometimes there's individual department meetings where the two people from the your audit department meet with my people from my audit, audit department. But I've seen very successful is creating mentoring teams. So if I have a tax, if I have a small practice and I have a, a person that handles a lot of the write-up tax for me, maybe someone in a similar role in the successor firm becomes their mentor. And they meet together regularly just to talk things through. You know, what vending machines work better than the arrest? How people handle dress codes? The types of things that you not always are on a master list. But the creation of mentoring teams to get people comfortable with everything from the work to the social aspects is very important. And creating clear goals that are measurable whenever you can for the new staff so they know what they have to do, what success looks like, how to get to that point, and then monitoring it and help them if they're falling short and reward them when they're not. This is an important time to look into employment agreements. 
if I'm acquiring or merging in a firm, I want to know whether that staff that, of the seller or mergee has an employment agreement. I don't want to find out I'm acquiring a firm and the staff member can leave and take all the clients with them. Also, when transitioning staff, you're going to most likely, the successor firm is going to need a new employment agreement for that staff. In today's world, a great reason to bring this up to them is confidentiality. There's so many issues about confidentiality that a lot of my larger firms have said to the smaller firms that they've merged into their team, listen, we need you to sign a non-disclosure confidentiality agreement. And a small part of that agreement happens to have a non-compete, a non-solicitation in it. If you present it as a non-solicitation agreement, you get someone back in, in, in up. Instead, if you Make, make an emphasis on the non-disclosure aspects, the confidentiality aspects, and there happens to be a non-compete in it, that seems to go over well. Make sure your employment agreement is reasonable. There are things that are not reasonable. Hey, if you leave this firm, you can't be an accountant in this county for the next 10 years. Remember that there are limits to what any court will back you up on. You cannot stop someone from making a living. You could stop them from raping your practice. You can't stop them from being an accountant. Many times when transitioning staff, there'll be issues about compensation differences. Usually it's in perks and benefits. For example, very recently in a small sole practitioner that we helped, they had two professional staff members that both got three weeks paid vacation. In the larger firm, that same level staff only got two weeks paid vacation. So what the what we worked out together was the successor firm said to those two, I know you used to get three weeks paid vacation. I can't give you three weeks paid and everybody else too. So what I'm going to do is raise your salary by a week. Therefore, if you decide to take a third week off, you can. It's without pay, but you'll be whole in income. If you decide not to, you'll just got to raise. So a lot of times it's just packaging how to overcome compensation differences. Remember to look at compensation for staff as a package. They're not making $50,000 a year. They're making it plus CPE, plus other expense reimbursements, perhaps some automobiles, perhaps health insurance, perhaps there's a, a life insurance or disability policy you cover some of your team members with. Look at it as a package and try and make sure that the packages will match up. Your biggest focus on is on the more important staff people. Everybody's important. I don't mean it in a belittling way, but some people are a little bit more critical for the success of the deal. Those are usually the people that have the most client interaction. If I'm a professional who works for you, for you and I personally go out and visit clients and spend a lot of time with these clients and help manage these clients, it's very important to, to set a plan that's going to help me feel comfortable because I could be part of the glue that cements the relationship and makes this transition even more successful. The greatest measure of success in any merger or acquisition is client retention. No matter how you look at it, if the clients are all retained, the revenue will be there, the seller will make the most, the buyer will make the most, the two merger firms who combine will make the most. So it's a very important to make a strategic plan about retaining clients. There's a lot of places to start, and we'll give you one sequence to it. One of the first things we have to decide is how are we announcing this? Who, and that I break down into three main categories. Who gets a phone call, who gets a visit, and who gets a letter? And there are things that are important to think about in all, all of those regards. I'm not gonna just send a postcard to my largest client nor should I go out and visit them alone. 1991, I had a gentleman went out to his biggest client to tell him about the merger he just did. And he lauded about the expertise this new firm had. At the end of that conversation, his client said to him, Murray, that's fabulous you're doing this merger, but you're the only one I deal with. If he would have brought John with him, that client would have said, John, nice to meet you, never wanna see you again. Remember, you are their most trusted advisor. You're there to lead them to the promised land, not the opposite. So those who get a visit, you should probably be bringing with you a team member from the other firm. If it's a succession plan, and I know ultimately partner A or manager B is going to be helping me transition this client, that's who I should bring from the beginning. 
Some are going to get a phone call. Some are going to get a letter. I'm going to talk about what the message should be in a minute, but it goes back to the gain of the success of firm, not the loss of me. But before we go into that, I wanted to talk about firm name options. I will tell you that one of the most exaggerated things I hear about is people who feel if their name's not in the firm, it's going to greatly suffer in client retention. I have no history that demonstrates that, even though I've had people insist that that was the case, but only to find out it wasn't. Clients aren't loyal to the name of the firm. In a small firm like most of yours, the clients are loyal to you. If you send the right message, they're not going to go to a total stranger because your name's not in the firm. Now, there are things that you can do that make sense. For example, if Nikki was to acquire my practice, maybe at the beginning, on the letterhead, it would say Joel Sinkin, CPA PC, division of Nikki Johnston and Associates. That you're allowed to do. And perhaps after the first busy season, we drop the Joel Sinkin division of and we've done our transition. But if my name is going to be in the successor firm, then I have to have equity, which means I also have liability and exposure. So usually if you send the right message, you don't have to get carried away and make the wholesale changes in the name of the firm. So what is the right message? What is it that we need to send? One of the things that we use today very effectively is the age of specialization. We'll talk about that better in a moment. It's important to think about how a phone is answered. If Nikki buys my practice January 1st and they answer the phone, Nikki Johnston and company, can I help you? Some of my clients might hang up thinking they dialed the wrong number. So usually what I suggest is the successor firm takes the the seller or mergee's phone number into, into theirs, makes it a dedicated line, so we know when that phone rings, it's a Joel Sinkin former client. So now you can answer the phone generically, accounting office. You can answer it, you reach the offices of Joel Sinkin and Nikki Johnston, can I help you? But you don't want to answer that phone differently day one until the message has been circulated loud and clear. Right? If there's a voicemail that I always had, then have my voicemail on yours. Whenever possible, have the same voices, the same voicemail, similar message. A lot of times people will have parties after a merger to introduce people, sometimes teaching sessions. If one of my new partners in the larger firm has expertise in estate planning, maybe we'll invite all the clients to a lecture on that. But let's get back to the age of specialization and how we're going to use it. One of the things I like to do is to, for the seller or merging firm, to, to break down their clients into categories. Doctors, professionals, retail, tax only, wholesale, whatever those categories are. So that what we can do is we can focus our message to the people in that category. And that's where you get to the announcement letter. Now let me start with something that's going to sound very anal but we have found it to be very important. When you send out an announcement letter, it should go out in the seller's envelope or the firm merging ups envelope with the new stationery inside. If you send it out with the successor firm's envelope, most of my clients won't open it. They'll think it's a solicitation from another accounting firm. That happened to us on a beautiful letter we wrote in the early 90s. Beautiful for us, nobody read it. So it should go out in the envelope. When should it go out? It's an interesting question. If we close a practice in, ja in June, and a, a lot of these clients are 1040 clients that we never deal with all year long, do we send them an announcement letter and give them a year to think about it? Or do we wait and slip it into the tax organizer? Personal choices that you need to think about. But one of the things you want to do is tie in the age of specialization to overcoming objections prior to even hearing the objections. Best way to overcome a, a, a problem is to solve it before it occurs. So let's look at the four main things that clients tend to be afraid of when they hear of a merger or an acquisition. The main four things are, is the owner that I've trusted all these years still there? The second concern is usually, is this gonna cost me more money? For those who go to the accountant's office, do I now have to travel a far distance to meet with my accounting? And for those that have, or work very closely with staff, are they part of the new deal? For example, our firm has a great accounting firm that we use, even though most of us are CPAs, 
um, but we're out of touch CPAs. I'm not one, my partners and uh, a lot of them are. Um, but at any rate, it's a key staff member at that firm that probably knows more about us than the partner. If they did a merger and acquisition, his retention would have been very important to me. So let's take those age of specialization that we've broken down our clients into categories and these four fears and transpose them into an announcement letter. So let's say that I'm selling my practice to Nikki. Let's say that this letter is going to the doctors that I work with. Here's what I would probably say in the first paragraph. I'm pleased to announce that I've merged into my firm, Nikki Johnston. Nikki is, has tremendous expertise in the medical community and the Trump tax laws, which will enable us to provide you additional services, yet maintain the same fee structure. I will remain the principal in charge of you as a client. We remain geographically sensitively operating here in Long Island, New York, and the same staff members you're used to dealing with are part of our new combined dedicated team of professionals. So in the first paragraph, I've said to my client, I've merged with someone. They're an expert in your profession. They're going to be able to help me provide you more services, yet not raise your fees. I'm still the person managing you. The staff's still here, and we're in the same area. The greater the loyalty between my clients and me, the higher my retention rate should be every time. So let's take advantage of that client loyalty and stop fearing it. Overcome these issues before they're raised. Make it the age of specialization. It's packaging. And I assure you, your client retention will be maximized. Now, how long does it take to transition those clients? It really depends. The more partner loyal, the longer it takes. The more brand loyal, the less it takes. So this ties into how often you see your clients. According to a study done by Accounting Today, 87% of accounting firms in 2016 only it was in the same room physically with their client once a year. We may communicate with them with portals and the cloud and email and phone, and we communicate more than we ever have, but less FaceTime. You can't really transition a relationship through the portal. You can only do it with FaceTime. So if I'm only seeing most of my clients once a year, three years is only three visits. So it takes you a much longer time to transition clients fully than most people think. It doesn't mean it has to be a full-time job. For example, I was teaching a class for the AICPA a little while ago, and someone raised their hand and said, but I don't want to work full-time three more years. So I said to them, not how much time you put into administration, not how much time you put into doing the work, but just how much time are you physically in the same room with your clients? He guessed about 250 hours a year. So I said to him, if you spent that same 250 hours next year, how would the client know a difference? You see, we perceive things that aren't necessarily reality. Clients only know what they see. They don't see you behind the closed door doing the work. They don't see you handling the HR and the IT and all the other issues that you handle. They just know when you're with them, what you're doing. And you can still be in contact through email, phone, and work much reduced. But you've got to put in transition time. And if they're partner loyal, not brand loyal, you really should think about putting starting this process sooner than later. Very important. There are people that are afraid to start the process early because they don't want to give up control. They don't want to have that accountability of merging into a larger firm and someone being someone's clock punching person instead of being master of their own domain. If it's Thursday and the weather's nice and I want to play golf, I play golf. If it's Sunday and work has to be done, I do the work, but I don't want to merge with someone telling me what to do. Well, if that's your reason for, for not doing a transition, look into a two-stage deal. On our websites, under the resource sections, are great articles on the two-stage deal. Stage one would be your transition period, where to the world it looks like a merger, but you maintain autonomy, control, and the same income you would have made, while having backup and support and starting a transition plan. Stage two is the buyout. Can't get be kept whole in income and paid for your equity at the same time because that's cash flow negative unless you're going to give both away. But if you do a two-stage deal and defer the purchase price during stage one, you would do a great transition, maintain control, maintain reasonable autonomy, have backup and support, and start your transition plan. It's a different CPE class, 
but it's an important thing to keep in mind because a two-stage deal creates tremendous uh, client retention, which means the highest values that the seller is going to get and the best values the buyer is going to get. Let's do our second polling question before we look into due diligence so we can make sure you all get your credit. Nikki? Okay, thanks, Jill. The second polling question is on the screen. What issues do you see affecting your practice most in the next year? Here you can choose succession, admitting new partners, client retention, and need for growth, or perhaps all of the above. As we mentioned, this is the second polling question. You do have to answer all three in order to get your CPE credit. We did the first poll pretty early, so if you hadn't quite logged on yet when we did the first polling question, you can send me your answer in the question box at the bottom there. The first question was, how many equity partners do you have in your firm? So if you didn't get a chance to answer that one, go ahead and do so now in the question box, and I'll record your response. And I'll wait just one more moment before I close this current poll. Looks like we have nearly everyone, but not quite. OK. It's closed. The results are there on the screen. So 35% say client retention, 24% succession, and then the remaining answers are an even, about an even split there. Okay, so we've got a little bit of everything. Hopefully everybody's going to get some value out of today's session then. That's our hope as always. Due diligence is a very interesting topic. What makes it interesting to me is I've done over 800 closings of accounting firms. I've never done one where the successor firm didn't do a pretty thorough due diligence. And how rare it is the selling firm or firm merging up has done any due diligence. I may not think that it requires equal amounts of due diligence, but I certainly believe it requires some due diligence. So let's look at, from different perspectives, what should be the keys in due diligence before we wrap today's session up. Let's start with the timing, when to do due diligence. I've consulted on many deals that we weren't involved from the get-go. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people have two, three, and four meetings, then perform a huge due diligence on each other's practices, basically find out it was exactly what everybody said, then made an offer that was refused. What an inglorious waste of time. Due diligence is a very invasive process. It reveals significant confidential information. It's very time consuming and it's dangerous where clients and staff might find out that something is amok. So when should you start the plan for due diligence? I don't think it's the day we meet each other. The way I always suggested is start off by if I'm the seller or merge, I'm gonna share with you a voluminous amount of information, but it's going to be generic. I'm not gonna give you my clients' names, but I can give you general information how much revenue I do, what percentage of that's my profit, what's my billing rate, what's my staff's billing rate, what's my staff's uh, compensation level, how much chargeable time, non-chargeable time, what software do I use, what's my lease information. I have forms, if anybody would like, send me an email, I'll send you an example of a form. That can be very revealing information that doesn't take a huge amount of time to put together and at the same time doesn't share information that is confidential. So what I like to do is share a lot of this generic yet detailed information. And what I say to the, the people that I'm consulting with, I want you to assume that they're the Pope and everything they told you is the gospel truth. Now let's make a non-binding offer now that we looked at this generic information. Sometimes it will include non-generic like a P&L and everything, but not full-blown due diligence. Let's make an offer. It's a non-binding offer. It's based on the information we've shared, but we make an offer. If that offer is not acceptable to me, thank goodness we did that exercise before we all invested into due diligence. If I'm in right field and you're in left field, let's work that out before we worry about looking at the nooks and crannies of my records. Conversely, if we are on the same page, then it makes sense to do the next step, and that's a more complete due diligence. Now, prior to doing that due diligence, the first thing that you need to do is make sure you get a non-disclosure agreement. I have examples of non-disclosure agreements I've used that are a page. I've had them that are seven pages. A lot of it depends on your level of paranoia, I guess. But there are certain keys that you should have no matter how short or detailed your non-disclosure agreement is. First, it should be a definition of what you can share and who you can share with and who you, and who you can. You know, we, it shouldn't be 
up to judgment. It should be very specific. We should also make sure that all information that I've given you will be safeguarded appropriately and either returned to me or destroyed based on how I direct it to be. And there should be penalties for violating this non-disclosure agreement or soliciting clients. I'm very proud to tell you that in over 27 years, I never remember, well, I shouldn't say that, I remember hearing about it once, but no deal have I ever been involved in did someone do due diligence, then break off the deal, then reach out to all the clients. We may not always be the greatest business minds in the world, I like to think we are, but the integrity of the CPA world is tremendous. And it's a very rare, rare thing. But you still need to protect yourself and have something in there. And usually you should have a penalty. For example, if any of my clients become a client of yours in the next year, you're going to pay me X percentage as a, as a penalty. If any of my staff become a client, a staff member of yours. But remember, you need reasonable perspectives, reasonable penalties, and reasonable time frames. I can't say to you that none of my clients could be your clients for the next 30 years. It won't hold up. So you got to be realistic about what you can preclude and what kind of penalties you could have. And different states have different regulations on that. States such as New York, Florida, and California are very challenging about, non, uh, about non-competes. They will limit you greatly. Others are a little bit more liberal with it. So make sure you have good advice, but make sure before you start sharing clients' names, you have a non-disclosure agreement that includes protecting the confidentiality of your client base. Now, the deal structure that you created often has heavy implications on the level of due diligence I'm going to do. So, for example, if I'm paying someone, as in a deal we closed fairly recently, 15% of gross collections for seven years uh, with no cash down, my due diligence is important as a successor firm, but it's not as critical because I'm not guaranteeing a certain fixed purchase price or minimum purchase price. If the, 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 because of the lack of risk in the collection deal that I mentioned up front, you probably won't have to do a full-blown due diligence like you would if it was a guaranteed purchase price, which was, is very rare, but usually you'd be doing an IRS level audit, if, if not greater than that. So it's always important to do it, but, but sometimes the deal structure will impact how deep of the process you'll go and where in the process you'll go. Now, if I'm acquiring a firm, again, there are varying things I should look at. They include, I want to get a good idea of the billings and how the collections work. What kind of cash flow am I going to see over what over the next couple of months? Is it very tax season oriented? Is 80% of my collections between March 1st and June 1st? How does it work? What's the general condition and nature of the clients? One of the concerns that a lot of firms have, especially when merging in or acquiring a small firm, is the quality control process. If, if my quality control process is much more robust than yours, it may take me more time and effort to derive the fees. So I want to confirm what the seller's role is now that I'm going to have to replace if it's a merger or, or but some sort of succession plan. I want to see about their avail availability to assist in the transition. Or what kind of role should they have? What kind of leases am I going to be required to take over? Not just the real estate. But sometimes there's server leases, equipment leases, copy machines, whatever I'm going to be expected to assume, I want to make sure I know. Then I got to review the staff, their backgrounds, their roles, their qualifications, licenses, the compensation package they're taking. What's their future? Is a lot of your staff reaching the point in time where they themselves are going to be looking to reduce their time commitment and retire? Are most of them young, looking to grow? Are there any malpractice liability issues and exposure issues? Am I getting your hard assets? Do I need your hard assets? Do I want your hard assets? Most of the time, if I'm acquiring a firm and bringing it into my infrastructure, your hard assets are very rarely of, of use to me. But it's important to know. And if I'm actually expecting to take them or need them, then I need to inspect them and make sure that then there's no liens or anything else on these hard assets things that we want to look at is an age analysis of the receivables. This could be very important. I'll give you a great example. Very recently in due diligence in a, a deal that we were doing in the Chicago area, it was a small sole practitioner, 800000 in revenue. Unfortunately, well, wonderful person, the worst collection process I've ever seen. 
averaging over 90 days late on most of his clients, which would have meant, if we didn't catch it and work something else out, that the buyer would have taken over this practice and been four to six months of doing work before they started collecting money that, that was their money. It was so dramatic because on 800,000 in billings, there were 500,000 in expenses plus. The successor firm actually said to the seller in that case, look, I need use of your, your AR whip and we'll need the payout period to catch it up because you're that delinquent in the payments. And I'm not going to be willing to work five or six months on these clients, give you a down payment, which also got rejected uh, or, or, or revoked. So some, understand the billings collections. Most times it's not going to be a shock. Sometimes there is a shock. One of the most important aspects of due diligence as a buyer I look for in a seller is how long they've had their clients. Because the longer they've had their clients, the greater the loyalty. And if we do a transition correctly, the greater the loyalty, the more likely we'll retain them, especially large clients. I love the fact if it's a family-oriented business, and I'm doing the children and the parents, I'm on second generation of those clients, that type of loyalty bodes very well in a transaction. I want to get an idea of the billing rates of the seller and their staff, but let's stop on a minute on billing rates. It's not to look at a piece of paper and say what that means. It means something completely different than that. What it means to me is what would the billing rates be of the successor firm? So for example, in a recent deal we had in Florida, the seller was putting on, uh, was only getting $200 an hour for his rates, the buyer was getting $300. But almost all the chargeable work the seller did would have been performed by seniors in the successor firm. And the seniors billing rate was only 150. So what looked like a problem on paper turned out to be a real positive at the end of the day. So it's very important that we don't look at billing rates without understanding what would the successor firm's billing rates be. Am I going to be able to, forgive me people, I, I, I didn't turn off all my lines. Um, am I going to be able to um, leverage that work down. Will my technology enable me to do it at a lower rate? These are things that we must get our grip on and handle and understand. Profitability is the same thing. We've got to translate profitability. For example, if I'm working out of my home and doing everything by myself with my wife supporting me and my net's 80%, is that your profitability going to be? If you could absorb my practice with no incremental increases in overhead, it's very profitable. If not, it's not. So you don't look at the billing rates on paper. Transpose billing rates, transpose profitability into what the successor firm is going to be. Most of the time, it's a benefit. Sometimes it's not. Maybe my quality control process isn't as robust as yours. And as a result of that, I, I'm going to have to put more time and effort to derive the fees. Look at who does the work and where. If as a seller I go out to my clients and spend a lot of time there, that's part of how those clients justify my fee. It's going to be important to think about how we can transition that. Check the work papers, the equipment, staff employment agreement. Not only look at services offered to make sure you can accommodate them, but services not offered and can you create some new cross-selling opportunities by doing so. And are we keeping their office as a satellite or moving it with us? If I'm selling my practice, I want to make sure the successor firm has the niches that I have, the licenses that are needed to do the work, the software, they have the capacity. Remember, as I said before, bigger is not always better, but sometimes the size of the success is not a proxy for culture. I've seen three partner firms that think they're PwC, and I've seen eight partner firms that are really eight sole practitioners sharing space. Make sure they'll be able to operate under a similar billing rates, or at least the invoices at the end of the day will come out to be pretty similar. As a seller or merger person going into a larger firm, I want to know how long they've been partners. They've just started their partnership. Makes me a little nervous. Doesn't mean I won't do the deal, but makes me a little nervous because maybe the problem's going to be that they don't find out they don't get along as well as I thought. I'd rather deal with partners that have been partners for a while. We talked about location, how important that is. Be flexible with it. Run a credit report on the successor firm. Make sure that there's no problems. Let's not be so politically correct that we forget sometimes that there are certain cultural issues or ethnicity or language issues in a firm. I had a firm in, 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 in the West Coast that was owned by women whose marketing was all women-owned accounting firm helping women-owned uh, businesses. 
Well, you couldn't sell that to a firm, though, of all men. I want to know if I'm selling or merging. And what's the success of firm's five-year plan? What's the aging of their partners? If I'm talking to a managing partner who's retiring in two years, who's behind him or her? And does the buyer have restrictive covenants on their staff that they're not going to be able to steal clients and cause problems in, in the merger or sale? When firms are merging together, they need to do everything we just said, all right? They, they, but you also have to do the culture test. Remember, what's it like to be a partner, staff, or client of a firm? Look at policy manuals and engagement letters to make sure that they're going to jive together. Make sure the long-term and short-term goals of the partners make sense. Most important document to review when merging is the ownership agreement. It usually will dictate how decisions are made, so how governance work, compensation, admitting new partners, terminating partners, buying out partners, capital accounts, Ownership agreements are the most important and revealing thing that tells you so much about a firm. Do they have debt? How are we going to de handle debt? There's good debt. Where well, we bought a practice, we're making a lot of money, but we owe the seller more money. But how do we handle that prior debt? You know, how is the compensation and benefit and perks packages going to meld together in, in when we merge together? Are we going to have big differences? In my firm, we pay the car lease, the medical insurance, and everything else. In your firm, we don't. How are we going to get past that? and get an idea of how people build and service the clients. Are they in a similar world? In many deals that are sales, you also have to think about if the seller's going to stay on in a part-time role, how are we going to compensate them? Right? Usually, I like to pay them a third of what they build out for. This way, I'm still tripling labor as a successor firm. I'm not asking a seller to come back in to do a bank wreck. They're coming in at the highest billable stuff, and I'm not paying for non-chargeable time. But there are times we'll come up with an hourly rate or even a per diem rate. Get a good idea of how the staff's going to blend, how space is going to blend, how we're going to integrate technology, generally speaking, what the client's financial health is, what the growth opportunities are, what kind of longevity they have, and the types of services provided to the clients, and more importantly, the type that aren't provided. Remember, when doing due diligence, transpose billing rates and profitability from what they are now to what they're going to be when we combine the two practices. Let's look at our last polling question then. Okay, thanks, Joel. The last polling question is on the screen. How many partners in your firm will likely slow down over the next five years? You can select none, all, some, or most. This is our third and final polling question. I know we're just a few minutes late, so there is a survey that pops up once we end the webinar. If you are unable to stick around for that, we, you can complete it later online. You'll just need to send me an email and I can send you the link to that. Again, you'll be able to reach me for that or for any other questions you have about the slides or the CPE by replying to any of those reminder emails that you got from GoToWebinar. So I'll go ahead and close the poll. We've got everybody having replied there, and Joel, I'll let you go ahead and finish us up. Okay, listen, I'm sorry I ran over, and I'm embarrassed that I turned off two of my lines and forgot to turn off the third line, so please forgive me, and I hope the people I just hung up with three, hung up on three times forgive me as well. On your page right now is a great succession uh, resource center that the AICPA has put together. It has a voluminous amount of information on deal structures, valuing practices, merges, succession plans, all sorts of tools that hopefully you'll find advantageous. On our website is tremendous information, especially under the real, the resource section. It's probably 60, 70 articles from the CPA Journal and Journal of Accountancy that shares detailed information on all sorts of aspects of mergers and acquisitions. There's also an FAQ session that section that if you have questions, it will it's interactive. It will get you the answers. So take advantage of these things. Any questions that came in that we didn't have the chance to review, I'll respond by email. Forgive me for my run on mouth. Thank you all for, for joining us in the session today. I hope everybody got value out of it. Thank you, Nikki.